Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you this morning. It's morning in Derbyshire in the UK, where I'm doing my training from, from my office. Um, welcome back to those of you who attended the first part of this training last week. We're going to do some further work this morning, focusing on getting ready to teach uh, the Pearson International GCSE Human Biology. Okay. So you're very welcome, and hopefully you can hear me um, clearly. Okay. Right, let's move on and look at today's agenda. So today's agenda, sorry, jump two slides. Today's agenda, we're going to look at assessment objectives because they are the items upon which your um, candidates and pupils will be assessed. We're going to look at how these um, affect the writing and um, the design of the two examination papers that we, we talked about last time. We're going to look in more detail at question types, so the different sorts of questions that appear on the human biology papers. We're going to look at how you and your students can understand mark schemes, how those mark schemes are used, how they're designed, and how using mark schemes can help you focus the way that your students answer um, the examination materials. And then once again, as we did um, last Tuesday, we're going to look a little bit at the resources and support that's available to you um, from Pearson. So before we start uh, the training proper, can you please all make sure that you've downloaded the delegate booklet the delegate booklet is essential for today's training, and I'll be referring to items within the delegate booklet um, to make the training more interactive and to allow you to um, attend the questions and the items and to interact with me and the other delegates. OK, so please make sure you do that. Um, we've shared with you via the Zoom uh, bar at the top. If you click on that, you can um, download the resources from there. If you're unable to do that, you can click on the three dots labeled more and you can download it from there. Label delegates download as file and the one you need is um, delegate booklet. And if you still can't do that, then uh, our host this morning has also shared with us um, a link within the chat box that I've been typing into. And if you click on that link, that will allow you to download those materials as well. Okay, excellent. I'll go through them on the screen as well. So if you're having issues, I should be able to help you. Okay, the first thing um, I want to do with you um, is to have a little, we, try, we tried to do this the other day, is to have a little, um, investigation as to how many of you are new to teaching this uh, qualification. So in the chat box where the messages have been going, can you please type, if you are new to the qualification type, I am new to the qualification. If you're an experienced teacher, type I'm an experienced teacher. Or um, if you've taught for, for many years, type that. So I've been new to the qualification just starting or taught it for many years. Okay, if you give me a clue, you could type that into the um, into the chat box, that would be excellent. So um, I'm gonna put in my response, I have taught this, or in my case, 30 years, so as long as it's been going. Uh, I put years wrong, years, I apologize for my spelling there. Um, okay, hopefully you're all typing in that, and I can see. So if you type into the box for me, then I can have a look at that, and then we can move on with the agenda. Because we're going to use this for your marking later. Just started. Excellent. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Excellent. OK, good. Lovely. OK, good. Good. Nice to have um, 
a long time ago I was an early career teacher, but there we are. It's nice to have new people joining. That's super. OK, if you type that in, that's great. Right, we're going to move on. So today we're going to look at assessment objectives, we're going to look at question types, we're going to look at mark schemes, and we're going to look at resources and support. OK, please keep typing the rest of you if you haven't had a chance to type that. OK. Right. Okay, so the aims and objectives for today's training are that we can develop a greater understanding of the assessment objective and from last time, these are AO1, knowledge and understanding, AO2, application of knowledge and understanding, and AO3, application of knowledge and understanding, whilst based on practical item, um, practical scenarios and experimental data. To understand the question types for qualification, to understand the mark scheme, to practice using the mark scheme using some student responses, and to look at the support provided by Pearson's. Excellent. OK, let's move on then to the next slide. Right. OK, so that's good. OK, so as we said last time, Pearson's are the largest supplier of um, learning materials and qualifications in the world, the UK's largest awarding body, best place to provide qualifications that are available internationally but are aligned to the British education system. So we offer um, international primary curriculum, we offer uh, lower secondary curriculum, we offer international GCSEs, and in the UK we offer GCSEs, we offer international A-levels, and in the UK, A-levels uh, based on the UK systems, OK? And today we partner with many, many schools and universities uh, and employers across the world. Um, and we recognise up to three and a half million qualifications, uh, three and a half million student qualifications each year. Excellent. OK, let's move on to do what we're doing today. So assessment objectives are really important. They're important in the way that... Uh, the specification has been built. They're important in the way the papers are designed. They're important on what your they, they look at what your students need to be able to do in the examinations. And obviously, they're important in terms of preparation of your students for those exams. Both papers have all of the assessment objectives on them, okay, which differs from what goes on at international A level. If you're involved in preparing those students, there is a some of the uh, ob assessment objectives only appear on certain papers. That's not the case for Human Biology GCSE. In Human Biology IGCSE, the AOs appear equally across the papers. So 40% um, of all of the marks, or 30% of, of a total marks in each paper, are for AO1, Knowledge and Understanding of Human Biology. Likewise, the same number of marks, 36 marks on each of the papers, or 40% of the total marks, are available for application of knowledge and understanding and analysis and evaluation um, in human biology. So that's AO1, AO2. And then AO3 are experimental skills and analysis and evaluation of data. That should say methods. It says methods for some reason. but um, Data and methods in human biology. That makes up 20%. Okay. The weightings are the same for AO1, AO2, and AO3 is slightly less. AO3 questions tend to focus or, on practical skills or assessing practical data. The total number of marks for recall has been reduced to 14 marks or 15% of the total marks on each paper. And maths questions can be either AO2 or AO3, although maths questions are usually AO2. Okay. The maximum number of marks that are available for multi-choice questions okay, uh, is eight with a, mi a minimum of six marks on each paper. We'll talk about multi-choice questions a little bit later. Okay. Remember, in human biology and in biology, 10% of the marks are for mathematics. And we spoke about mathematics last week. And we'll speak a little bit about mathematics again today. OK, so moving on to the next slide. OK, so AO1 looks at knowledge and understanding. OK, and it looks at uh, recall, 
that it's not all just recall. So recall could be facts. I mean, we said a maximum of 14 marks. Demonstrate understanding of scientific techniques and procedures. So AO1 is about describing or explaining or stating what is present on the specification. It's about the biology content. It's not necessarily about using the content. So for example, in AO1, we wouldn't expect students to design, improve or evaluate practicals, okay? But we might expect them to recall questions, um, but these questions would tend to carry fewer marks and have a limited range of command words. We'll be looking at the command words in some detail a little bit later this morning, okay? So AO1 includes state and recall and remember and, and items like that, but it also includes describing and explaining phenomena that are present and described in the content of the specification. Okay. So if, for example, you're asked to describe the digestion that happens in the small intestine, that would be an AO1 question, even though it might have three or four marks. It would still be AO1 because it's just describing, an ex or in this case, describing, but it could be explaining, describing what's going on. It's not about application. Okay. Let's move on to our next slide. So we're going to look at um, our first activity today. Activity one was talking about how long you've done, how long you've been teaching the course for. So activity two is described in the um, delegate booklet. I'm going to read them to you anyway. We're going to look at the command words, okay? And I'm going to ask you to consider four command words that would be used to test recall. Not four command words that could be used to test anything about AO1. I'm just going to think about initially those command words that would be used to test recall. Okay, so let's look at the command words. Um, I'm going to, they're available in the in your delegate booklet. They're also available in the appendix at the back of the specification. But I'm going to um, just read them to you here. So in your delegate booklet, in activity two, it has a whole list. So you've got add, you've got calculate, comment, complete, deduce, describe, determine, design, discuss, draw, estimate, evaluate, explain, give or state or name, give a reason, identify, justify, plot, predict, show, sketch, state, suggest. What I'd like you to do in the chat box, okay, I'll give you a few minutes for this. So in the chat box, please type Four command words from that list, from your knowledge, from the delegate booklet, that are used to test recall only. Okay? And you're going to type them in the box where you've been interacting with me on the screen. So please do that now, and then we'll go through some together. But I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that before we move on. Thank you. Excellent. Well done. And the rest of you type as well. If I don't feel as I'm here on my own. Thank you very much. Excellent. Not explain. We'll go through why in a minute.
Excellent. Thank you. Any more? Yeah. Sketch, probably not. It's a bit more application in that. I mean, it might do, depends on the context. Certainly state or name, yes. Identify, excellent. Come on. There's 20 of you out there. Let's have some more responses typed in, please, if you can. That would be great. Good, excellent. Good, list, excellent. Okay, often, um, I, I, as the delegates are writing here, um, definitions can be recalled. So, for example, state what is meant by the term gene. State is what was meant by the term genome. Okay, they are recall. Okay, excellent. Well done. Pleased with that. So the ones that I have identified, um, there are others obviously that you've used, but we could also look at so examples such as state name give what why. What why are often used in regards to multi choices. However, it does mean that setting recall will exclude other command words such as describe. Okay. Recall tends not to use describe, to be honest. It depends on the structure of the question and how it's set out. But usually these are one mark or two mark answers. Okay, Because remember, we're limiting the number of recall answers that we're putting on our exam papers. We want what's called higher level functioning, not just remembering stuff. OK, excellent. Well done. Let's move on to the next one. OK, so. Let's have a look at these questions that are found in the delegates booklet, okay? What we're gonna do is to type the number of the questions that are recall into the chat panel. So I'm going to do these. Okay, let's see if I can get it to come on the screen without it giving away the answer. These PowerPoint ones, right, okay. So we've got four questions there, one, two, three, and four. You can look in your delegate book. You don't need to because obviously um, you should be able to see them on the screen. What I'd like you to do in the chat panel here is to type the number of the questions that are recalled. So if you think two and four are recall, you just type two, four in the box. If you think one, two, three, and four are recall, you type one, two, three, and four in the box. Okay, so have a go at that for me. That'd be great. And then we'll see if your conclusions are the same as mine. One and four, good. Okay. One, three, and four. Okay. One, two, three, and four. Mm, okay. Okay, so to name two components of a lipid. 
I think that is a recall item. OK, come back to number two in a minute. Uh, right. The two strands of a DNA molecule are held together by base pairs. How are the pairs linked together? Well, I think that's recall. So I think one and four are definitely recall. So let's look at two and three. Now, we said that describe is not normally a simple recall. OK. However, it is almost identical to the statement in the specification. So I think two is possibly recall. State one precaution that reduces the safety risk of working with bacteria, I don't think is recall. Even though it's um, a state, I don't think it's recall. Let's see what the chief examiner thought the answers were for this, see if he agrees with me. Okay, we necessarily do that. Okay, good. So they did agree with me. So one, two, and four are recall. Um, three is marginal. It's, it's more about understanding the risk, isn't it? So if it's an element of application or understanding in it, then it's not recall. Okay, good. That gives us an idea of the kind of things that we're using. So thank you very much for that. I'm now going to move on to my next slide. Okay, so this is AO2. Okay, so AO2 is about the application of knowledge, understanding, analysis, and evaluation in biology. It makes up 40% of the marks. So to meet the AO, students will be expected to apply their knowledge and understanding of ideas. It builds on the expectations of AO1. You can't apply your knowledge unless you have the knowledge, okay? So it's no good just being good at applying stuff. You need to have that information. You need to know what DNA is. You need to know what a sexually transmitted disease is. You need to know what the methods of contraception are. You need to know when ovulation takes place. You need to know the different sources of disease before you can do application questions. So knowledge is really important. AO1 is really important, and AO1 is the foundation of the other two assessment objectives. Okay. It builds on the expectations of AO1, and they must apply their knowledge and understanding of scientific inquiry techniques and procedures. Now, these questions are often more demanding. We often talk about these as having a higher cognitive demand. Some students may find it difficult to relate their knowledge to the context of a question, as a context may or may not be unfamiliar to. And some may struggle to link the skills they've developed um, to give accurate results. So AO2 is sometimes about taking something, and we spoke last Tuesday about this, from one part of the specification, description of biological molecules, for example, and applying it to another part, sort of digestion, etc. OK, so it's often about linking and it's about understanding how to apply your knowledge. OK, let's have a look at our next slide. Right, we're going to look at some application questions. We're going to look at the type of the questions that expect students to apply their knowledge and understanding. So you'll need the delegate booklet for this. OK, I'll go through and look at this delegate booklet as well. Okay, so we've done command words. We've identified which of those were recall questions. And we're now looking at activity four, application questions. Okay, let's do the first one together. So the first one says, the passage describes what happens when the order of bases on a DNA strand changes. Use information from the box to complete the passage. Okay.
to the first thing for that question, the one that looks at the passage on DNA. It is. Students have to be able to apply the understanding not only of DNA, but also to, to develop a coherent and correct passage. So even though they're given the information to use, it is an example of an application question. OK, so question one. I type this in the box here. Question one. Is application. OK, what I'd like you to do is to use the delegate booklet, have a go at question two, three, four, five and six and decide whether these are application or not. So it's questions one, two, three, four, five, and six from the delegate booklet. Are they application or not? Are they AO2 or not? And then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give myself a drink of water. I'll give you five minutes to do that. So what you're doing is you're looking at the delegate booklet, the passage on DNA, the function of tendons and ligaments, MRSA in the immune system, drug statements, labeling the diagram and calculating a breathing rate. Are they AO2? And you're going to decide whether they're AO2. If they're AO2, type the number in the box for me, please. And I'll go and get myself some water. And I'll be back in two minutes to go through them with you. Remember the fact and in the delegate booklet as activity four. OK, I'll be back in a moment. Having a look at those questions for me, those six questions. We do. So we decided question one was definitely application. Question two. Described by the function of a tendon is different from the function of a ligament. Question three, explain why MRSA bacteria increase more rapidly in people with weakened immune system. Okay. Good. Excellent.
Okay, give you a couple more minutes to do these, and then we'll go through these together. Good, excellent, good, excellent. Okay, good. Remember, we said calculations are got to be AO2 because there's a process going on. But I'll give you another minute to do them. Right, let's have a look. So the first one we decided that students have to be able to apply their knowledge, not only of DNA, but of terminology to create a right passage. So, okay, they think, he thought number one was uh, application. I think it's marginal as well as application, not, but application. But two is definitely application. Because even though tendons and ligaments are on the spec, OK, they're not just asking you that um, they're asking you to do some processing. So what they're doing, OK, is they're saying. Go back to it, sorry, if I don't know the screen for question two, describe how the function is different. So you're needing to do a comparison. You're needing to make a comparison between the function of tendons and the functions of ligaments. So that so number two is also application okay number three explain why mrsa increased more rapidly in people people with a weakened immune system explain or either ao1 or ao2 in this case it's ao2 okay because they're having to relate what happens with mrsa compared uh, to normal bacteria when someone has a, a compromised immune system so there's quite a lot of processing going on in that. Um, question three. So we said three was application as well. Question four. Bring down on my screen a bit. Question four. Caffeine is a type of drug. It gives you a statement about drugs. And then you need to apply that to work out what it is. So it certainly is application. Okay. You have to work out which is true. So four is... Um, application as well. Five is merely labeling part of the brain. So that's straight from the spec. So I think five is recall. And then six, using data to calculate something is AO2 because that is a uh, calculation. So I think one, two, three, four, and six are, um, are application. So let's have a look uh, back at... PowerPoint shows us, we are. So let's have a look. So passage on DNA, we said they have to have understanding, but also terminology. So we think that's okay. So it should be, oops, Daisy, that's not worked, sorry. Oops, oops, screen's gone. So passage on DNA is um, application. Function of tendons and ligaments is application. Uh, question three, ideas are being linked. They need to know about knowledge and understanding of the uh, immune system. Drug statements, um, think a little harder, making a choice and arrive at the correct time. So a little bit more uh, than just simple recall. Question five is recall. And question six, again, calculation breathing rate is um, application. So they are all application, if I type this in the box. So they're all AO2 except five, number five.
Okay, thank you for that. Good. Let's move on then to the next one. Right, AO3 next, which we said was about experimental skills, analysis and evaluation of data and methods. I don't know why it says methods, but and methods in human biology. Okay. To meet the criteria, students are expected to interpret and evaluate, make judgments and draw conclusions, and to develop and improve experimental procedures. Okay. So interpret interpretation and evaluation, students expect to analyze data. So they might look at a graph, they might look at information in a passage, they might look at a table of information, and then put forward their ideas in terms of evaluation. Questions that fall into this category will also expect students to demonstrate practical skills developed during the compulsory practicals we talked about last week, and also a knowledge of the uh, suggested practicals. Practical terminology might also be tested as well, we said, which is like, to be expected. Um, practical terminology guides is available in the download from today's session. More complex command words are likely to be used to meet this criteria. So the sort of command words we might expect associated with AO3 would be, let's have a look, let's go back to my command word list and we'll have a look at them together. So you might expect command words like justify. Deduce, evaluate, okay, discuss. These are the sort of analysis. So they might be used in AO2, but equally they can be used in AO3 as well. Okay, good. Let's carry on then to the next practical, uh, the next slide. Right? So here's some examples of AO3 questions. Okay. Describe an experiment to show that bile salts are effective in emulsifying lipids. Okay. So it says, for example, the specification says part um, 6.8, expect students to understand the role of bile in emulsifying fats. There's no compulsory or suggested practical in the specification that's linked to the content. But from the skills that the students have gained from their activities, they're expected to develop an experimental procedure. So this is exactly the sort of experiment that they might be expected to be able to describe an experiment to test. So this is an example of an AO3. OK, if you look at the second example, use the information from the bar chart and your own knowledge to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of birth control pills and sterilization. So students are making judgments from data. Again, this makes. Um, this is a good example of an AO3 type question because you're doing comparison, you're using data, you're making comparisons. OK. It says, not all questions designed to meet the criteria for AO3 are based on practical. Others may test students' knowledge, understanding, interpretation, evaluation. And that's what that question is doing. It's looking at information, it's using data, not necessarily data from practical the students done, or data from uh, an, an investigation scientists have done, or a graph, and then using that to make conclusions is an example of AO3. Good. So we've covered examples of AO1 questions and the command words. Examples of AO2 questions and the command words, and examples of AO3 questions and the command words. It's really important when you're teaching IGCSE human biology that you are able and you share with your students those command words. So I would give my students 
would I give them a copy of the specification or as a separate sheet, the command words so that they know when they're answering an item in the class situation or a test situation or a mock exam or finally in the IGC exam itself, they know what that command word tells them to do. OK, so they know the difference between describing the effect of temperature on enzymes and explaining the effect of temperature on enzymes. OK, so they need to know the difference between those two. And command words and knowledge of command words will help them gain uh, the best marks that they can because they'll recognize what the examination is looking for. OK, let's move on to the next part of the, our training. So we're now going to look at different question types. OK, so this is not about necessarily um, the assessments. This is about the sort of questions that appear um, across the different papers. OK, so in in your two papers, you will have multi choice questions in both papers. And we said there's a limit to the number you can get. That there will be short objective uh, questions which require one answer or two answers, a two word answer or a, 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 maybe a sentence answer. There will be open responses where they might need to write several sentences, three or four marks or even more for an experiment design question. And there'll be calculations. The important thing about calculations and how we teach calculations is we must uh, a reminder of our students, uh, your candidates, that they should show the working of every stage. And by showing the working every stage, they're more likely to gain marks, even if they get the final calculation wrong. Paper two on IGCSE Human Biology also contains a comprehension question. Okay. Uh, and, and students will need practice at those. They've appeared in the SAMs, they've appeared in paper so far. Okay. All questions start with a command word, which we just spoke about. A list of command words can be found in the delegate booklet, which you said your students should be familiar with those command words. That will really help. OK, moving on. So multi-choice questions. Most questions of this style are awarded one mark. OK, multi-choice questions can be found throughout the paper and range in difficulty depending on the context, content, and the, what we call the target grade that the question is aimed at. So they might be a, they might be a simple, might be a, a diagram. They might say, identify the pituitary glands. They might be, identify the, uh, the ovaries or whatever it is. Uh, and it's a simple, straightforward recall. They might, however, be a calculation. What is the probability that the second child will be colorblind and male? Okay, so that's quite complicated, but it still could be and quite challenging and probably aimed at a, a, a target grade above seven because it's got genetics and predictions and it's got combining probability. It's quite a difficult question, but still multi-choice. The most common style of multi-choice questions are where candidates choose a correct answer out of four that are given. They're the most common. Multi-choice questions can be AO1, AO2, or AO3. Uh, multi-choice questions are computer marked, than anyone computer marked. The number of multi-choice questions in an examination paper is limited at eight. So the most you'll get is eight out of each paper. So eight out of uh, how many marks each paper has. OK. Let's move on to the next slide. Right. Um, this is in the delegate booklet, but it's on the screen anyway, so we could probably just do it from the screen. Let's have a look. OK, it says. Type your response to each question in the chat panel below. Which assessment objective is covered by this question? The question says, menstrual cycle is 28 days. On which day of the cycle is the ovum likely to be released? 
Okay. Now, this is an interesting one. Is this AO1 or AO2? Do you think? Is it AO1 or AO2? Type your answer into the chat box. Okay, this is good. This is good. Excellent, this is what we like. So, the, it's either AO1 or AO2, isn't it? Now, I think for the cycle at 28 days, students should know ovulation takes place on the 14th day. So I think it is AO1 rather than AO2. That's what I think. However... If it wasn't a multi-choice question, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. And the question was, a female has a menstrual cycle of 32 days. Suggest on which day ovulation would occur. I think my question, the second version of a question, could be AO2 because they'd have to work out where the centre of the cycle is and then use their knowledge of 14 out of 28 to convert that. So with a standard 28-day cycle, which is what the typical, you know, if there's such a thing as typical, in inverted commas, I think that would be AO1. But in this case, it's AO1 because it's a standard 28-day cycle. But I can understand why you might think it's AO2 because there's a little bit of processing involved, isn't there? Okay. But they think it's AO1. Right. Secondly, what do you think would cause students problem with that question? It's a bit of an open-end question. Why might they have problems? If a student is, if the student's knowledge is what we call insecure, they don't have secure knowledge. Okay. Then as they go through the A, B, C, D offerings as alternatives, they are confused. So unless they securely know that the answer is 14, they might get, oh, maybe it's 20, or maybe it's one. So what I say to my students is, if it's a simple, straightforward question like that, Answer it in your mind before you look at the alternative answers. Yeah. So. If it wasn't multi-choice and the question was on which day. Of the cycle is the ovum like the release I go is 20, it's 14 and then look and see if 14 appears as one of the answers. OK, and that means that the students less likely to be deflected by what they call a dis excuse me, what they call a distractor item. Okay, so that's a technique that often we use to encourage students to be more confident and more secure in their knowledge. Okay, let's move to the next item. Okay, oops, data. Let's look at the next question. So the next question, OK, it says animal cells are made of components that each carry a particular function in a cell. Draw one straight line from the cell part. To its function in the cell. OK. So this is. Again, an AO1 question because it's recall. Students should know that this is recall. OK. A linking exercise, okay, can also be multi-choice, but just laid out in a different way. Most often students gain one mark for each correct linkage with questions of this style, most often carrying a maximum of three marks. This type of, of multiple choice is slightly more challenging than the previous one, as students have more options to choose from. Okay, it really, I'm not convinced it's three marks, because once you've got two of them right, then the other answer's got to be the other one. But anyway, they give them three marks. OK, so it's a quite straightforward question. So obviously you've got, oh no, but you, you've got four questions. So you have got three, three, 
three from four because I couldn't see the bit. So it is three marks. Okay, good. And it's just set out in a slightly different way. Okay. Right, let's have a look at activity six. Okay. Um, Multi-choice table is activity in delegate booklet. Is the question shown an example of multi-choice? So let me go and have a look at the delegate booklet. If you've got your delegate booklet to hand, you can see if that is right for activity six. Let's go on here. I'm going to find activity six in the delegate booklet. Here we go. Right, take a look at the question below. Is the question shown example of multi-choice? Please type your S or no in the chat box, right? The statements are about the use of immobilized enzymes in food and beverage industry. Amylase is used to convert lactose to galactose and glucose in the production of lactose from milk. Glucose and fructose are produced from sucrose in the production of slimming foods. Which of the statements is correct? Well, obviously that is a multi-choice question, okay? It's set out in a different way, but it's still a multi-choice question. So the answer you type into the box is yes, it is a M C Q. Just set out in a slightly different way. That's all. Okay, good. Let's move on. The next sort of questions that we're going to look at are called um so it is that's a tick coming up there saying yes it is okay short objective questions these questions involve a rhythm response that carries less than four marks okay the style and structure of questions can vary significantly some examples might be gap to fill in to complete sentences or paragraphs okay shorter written answer for example a description explanation or conclusion remember description can be AO1 or AO2, explanation can be AO1 or AO2, conclusion is normally going to be AO2 or AO3, and completing tables. Okay. Understanding of command words is really important. Students can find it difficult to differentiate between explain and describe. Very often this is what we need to reinforce. As short responses often include making conclusions from graphs, and this misunderstanding can cost marks. Most command words used in short, uh, most command words can be used in short objective questions. Okay, good. So there are examples of short objective questions, very common in the paper. Moving on, oops, those are some. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Okay, here's an example of a short and so diagram one shows a normal or uh, basis along one strand of DNA. Diagram two shows the same DNA, but a change in the order of a basis. OK, and it says use a diagram to describe the change in the order of basis on DNA. So this is a short objective question. It has two marks. OK, which assessment objective do you think that is type your answer in the box which ao do you think it is type it in the box for me use the diagram to describe the change excellent okay good very good because they're using the information, they're using their own knowledge, but they're applying it to this situation. Okay, so it's describe, but it's AO2. Really good, really pleased. Good.
let's move on. Next example, another short objective answer, sorry, question. Let's have a look at this, thank you. Let me move on to the next one. Here we go, right. Short objective question, nucleic acid X, nucleic acid Y moves to, and then substance, oh, you've got um, things labeled, structures labeled Z. So it says, state three structural differences between nucleic acid X and nucleic acid Y. Okay. Right, what AO do you think this one is? Now think carefully, because although we're using state, it's not straightforward. So what do you think this is? So this one, I'm going to type it on here. Thank you. Even though it's using state, what AO do you think it is? What do you think that one is? Type your answer in the chat box. What AO do you think this is? State three differences between nucleic acid X and nucleic acid Y. Good. Excellent. If it was state three differences between RNA and DNA, that you know, you could say, well, in that case, it's just AO1. But in this case, they've got to identify, they've got to work out that nucleic acid Y is able to leave the nucleus. So nucleic acid Y must be RNA. Nucleic acid X that stays in the nucleus is DNA. So I think it's quite a bit to this. So that's why I think it's AO2. Okay, excellent. Well, very well done. Right, next one. Okay. The next sort of question then are open response questions. Okay, so these are longer questions. They can carry four or more marks. Okay, and the number of uh, responses on any one question paper is flexible, although one carrying um, more than four marks tends to be limited, normally a maximum of two. There are fewer open responses on a question paper than there are objectives, short answers. Okay. So they carry four or more marks. There's sometimes known as extended prose. There are more lengthy written responses respect to the students. And there's limited variation on the structure of open response as students should be able to demonstrate scientific uh, literacy in prose. OK, so we'll see some examples of these. So these might be a longer describe, a longer explain. Equally, they might be... Um, and evaluate, they might be a discuss, using data from um, a table or comparing um, graphs or comparing or contrasting uh, some, ex some experimental data that has been described to the students. So let's move on. So we're going to look at this one. Right. So this is the same question that we saw previously. It was a different part of it. This is the second part of the question that shows um, DNA and RNA and nucleic acids. So this is another part of a question seen previously. The whole question, including sub-questions, multi-choice, short objectives, and open response. Uh, command words, and although it's less common to have 
describe as an opening to an open response question, the question shown is an example of this. Open response questions carry more marks, often require students to explain, compare, or evaluate. Okay, these command words will give students more scope browsing in depth. So describe the functions of nucleic acid X and Y and the structure labeled Z. So this is, again, um, a longer open-ended question. Okay, again, it's probably we got um, elements of AO2 in it because uh, they have to identify X and Y to be able to describe the function. Likewise, they need to identify Z as a ribosome to describe the functions in there. So it's an open-ended, longer type question. So that's the sort of example an open response question might be in their paper. Okay, But obviously, Sam's and previous papers will have other examples we could think of. Okay, so here's another question. This might be aimed at students working at higher grades or higher target grades. OK, so, for example, scientific terminology is expected here with knowledge of hormones and menstrual cycle. Students be expected to name hormones and understand the effects on the body, including negative feedback responses. OK. So the question is, a prolactinoma is a non-cancerous tumour of the pituitary gland. Pertomone can interfere with normal production of hormones by the pituitary gland. Explain why one symptom of this tumour in females can be reduced fertility. Okay, so there's lots of things they need to be able to process and then explain. So it's a typical example of an AO, uh, it's AO2 question, but also an open response question. So these are sorts of things that they might expect to have. Okay, moving on. Right, let's think next about math skills. Okay, calculations are compulsory in all UK qualifications. We said this, so in biology and in human biology, 10% of the marks are calculations. 10% of your marks can make a difference of two grades in your exam. Okay. 10% of marks is a wide range of marks, okay? Straightforward addition, subtraction, division are not given marks if used on their own. So we're looking for what's, well, you, what they use is what's called level two maths. And level two maths is basically anything that appears in GCSE maths on the higher tier, okay? So it's more complicated. Um, there's a math sheet in the delegate booklet. We looked at the math sheet last time. Uh, the limited number of maths marks can be allocated to graphical analysis as data is being used to form an answer. So the minimum number of maths marks on a 19 mark paper is nine. Okay. A uh, guide to maths for scientists is available to download from today's training session. So it talks about maths there as well. I would always practice mathematics with my human biology students. I would not assume that they're able to transfer their maths knowledge from the maths lessons into their biology lessons or their human biology lessons. So I teach all the maths, be it percentage calculations, be it probability, be it graph plotting, be it analyzing information. I would teach it within the context of the human biology classes. I think that makes it better for the students and clearer. Okay, here's an example of a math skill. It says the pie chart shows the worldwide industry's use of immobilized enzymes. Okay, it says the total estimated market value of these enzymes is 3.9 billion. Calculate the estimated value of immobilized enzymes in the food and beverage industry. Okay, so so it's a straightforward calculation for two marks. Okay, so you give them one value, and from that you need to calculate the rest. So that's a typical example of a maths skill and a maths question in the paper. So that would be AO2. Okay, let's look at another example. Calculate the percentage change in the number of reported cases between 2003 and 2011. So this obviously relates to uh, a comprehension. The comprehension, remember, would appear on uh, paper two. 
<laughs> and, and, and in your comprehension question on paper two, there are line references. So it tells the students where they find that information to work out the stage. So this is a multi-stage calculation of percentages. As a calculation involves many steps, it gets more marks. The question involves the use of subtraction and division, which are credited in this case because they use as part of a longer calculation. Okay. They need to be able to, if students are poor at doing percentage calculations, they need practice at this. Okay, let's move on. Next one. Right, here's another one. Math skill. The damage of a lumen in a blood vessel is 10 millimetres. The diagram has been drawn 50 times larger than the actual size of a blood vessel. Calculate the actual size of a lumen in this blood vessel. Give your answer in micrometers mu m. Okay. So students need to be able to carry out unit conversion. Okay. And they need to work out magnification as well. So this is a common sort of mathematics question that they might get in their exam. So it's good for students to know the relationship between obviously millimetres and centimetres. They also need to know the relationship between micrometres and millimetres as well. So it's a good idea for students to know that. Okay. Moving on. Okay, another math skill here. Use data from the graph to calculate the rate of breathing at rest. Give your answer in breaths per minute. Okay. And then it says the mean tidal volume of breathing is at rest is 0.3 dm cubed. Calculate the mean tidal volume of breathing between 35 and 45 seconds. So students often need to extract information from a graph or a table in order to carry a calculation. If graphs are analysed incorrectly, students will be able to gain the marks. So often they'll need to read something off the graph and then use that in their answer, which is why it's got three marks. OK, good. Let's move on. So lots, so lots of practice at maths questions uh, where they fit into the, your content teaching uh, and lots of reinforcement and lots of modelling of how to do the calculations. OK. Well, look back at the example calculations given. These are given in your delegate pack. Decide which math skill each covers. Type your response in the chat by adding the number in each case. So if we look at the delegate booklet, I'll go through and tell you these. So we've done that. We've got our list of maths in the delegate booklet. So example one was the pie chart. Okay. Example two is the percentage change. Example three is the magnification. Example four is the breathing rate. Example uh, four, okay, breathing rate is two parts to it. Okay, so what we're going to try and do then is in the chat box, we're going to do example one and, the, and what math skill you think it is. And then the same for examples two, three, and four. And for four, there's like four part one and four part two. So you're going to do two, three, four, one, and four, two. So have a go. I know it's quite tricky. Go into the math skills, the delegate booklet. See if you can work out 
which math skills are being assessed, and then we'll go through them together. So I'll give you five minutes to do that. And then we'll go through them together. So have a go. The math skills are listed in the delegate booklet. So 1C, 2, whatever it is. Uh, and see if you can get those right. See if you can work out which math skill it is. And then we'll, I'll give you five minutes and then we'll go through those together. So have a go at that. And then we'll go through the answers together. Thank you. How are we doing? Right, let's have a look. Well, the first one um, is the pie chart. So it uses percentage calculations and also then changes the subject of an equation. So I think example one is... Type it here. I think example one is one C and then changing the rearranging equation is two B. Okay. Have a go at three, four, one, and four, two for me. Obviously, students themselves don't need to know which skill it is. They just need to be able to do them. So you need to make sure that in your teaching scheme, you address all of the math skills that appear in the delegate booklet or indeed all of the math skills that appear in the appendix in the specification, which is the same list, obviously.
Okay. Um, you obviously find that bit tricky. Let's move on and I'll tell you the answers. So, the first example uses percentages, which is skill 1C, and then 2B, which is rearranging an equation. Okay, example 2, which is percentage change, so that's skill 1C. Example 3, which is the magnification, okay, that's probably what we describe as, um, as 2I, mag order of magnitude. It's not ideal to that. Sometimes it might be order of magnitude and rearranging an equation. OK, so students need to know that, magnif that um, magnification equals size of image over real size. So they need to know that equation. Okay. Good. OK, example four was 4A, translating between graphical and numerical. And then four two uh, was the example of finding an algorithmic mean, which is too big. So the important thing is not that you're able to identify yourself, the name and the number of the calculations, but that your scheme of work allows them to cover the, the maths content that's indicated. So recognize and use numbers in decimal form, recognize and use numbers in standard form. So things like the number of blood cells um, per cm cubed or per, uh, uh, need to you normally express in terms of standard form so 2.6 times 10 to the 6 whatever okay um estimates ratios fraction percentages and powers correct number of significant figures i often get questions about this as my, in my role for ASCII expert for biology, I often get questions about uh, how many decimal places do we use? Well, really, it shouldn't be about decimal places. It should be about significant figures. So your answer should have the same number of significant figures as your data. So if your data is 19.6, that has three significant figures, okay? Therefore, your, your, your answer should be to three significant figures as well. If your data is 350, then that has two significant figures. Your answers to calculations should be the same number of significant figures as well. So find mean, bar charts, graphs, probability, mode and medium, orders of magnitude, we said, a simple algebra in terms of changing subject, numerical values, solving equations, translate between graphical and numeric form, which is about plotting graphs, Plot two variables, determine the slope, uh, which is 4D, and then uh, calculate triangles, rectangles, surface area, and volumes of cubes. And, which are, and there are all the math skills which are listed. Okay, good. Let's move on. Okay, let's look at mark schemes now, which, uh, since these are all published, students seem to lack. OK, the mark scheme contains general guidance followed by answers to the questions given in the question paper. The general marking guidance is aimed to support the examiner during the marking process. OK, it is also useless for centres that use past papers assessments and as mock exams. And also, I think it's useful for candidates as well. OK, however, uh, the mark scheme um, doesn't tell you particularly how to apply the mark scheme. How to apply the mark scheme is the training that's given to examiners in terms of standardization, okay? So it's not just about the mark scheme and what's written there, although that's very helpful, it's how that is then applied. And we'll see some examples as we move forward. Okay, so let's look at a typical mark scheme and how it's set out. <clears throat> so the mark scheme template that's used, you have uh, the question number, which has the number and sub questions, so 1A.3 or 2B3 or 2B1 or whatever. It then gives you the middle column. It says if more than one mark is uh, allocated a question, then there'll be a bullet points in the answer column. Alternative answers are separated within a marking point using a slash. Okay. And notes column. Uh, 
shows acceptable and non-acceptable, and the marks column is the final one. So notes often is sometimes well, is often called additional guidance, or sometimes called additional guidance. So some marks you might have the term additional guidance rather than notes, but, but it basically it's it's notes on how to apply the mark scheme. Okay, so it might say allow this or not allow that, or it might give examples of alternatives within the additional guidance. And sometimes for the longer and more complicated questions, the additional guidance is, 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 is long and important. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This is an example mark scheme. Okay. So we've got question 4A1, ureter, vas deferens, or sperm duct, which are alternatives, and D is testes, and it shows each of those gets one mark. And then marking point two, obviously the function of produces fluid, enables sperm to swim, contains nutrients of sperm activators or allows the great pH. That scores three marks. And then finally, there's um, another question on the 4A.3, symptoms, uh, difficulty in passing urine because swelling closes the urethra. Or the exit from the bladder, so obviously about prostate issues. Okay, so that's how it's sent out. Uh, each of the separate marks points has a semicolon after it. Alternative spellings are acceptable only if they're taken to mean what's expected, and if incorrect spelling doesn't have another meaning. Okay, so urethra and ureter we need to be careful about the spelling lest the candidate is not clearly indicated whether he's talking about one or the other so ureter and urethra mitosis and meiosis are an example okay gene and gene maybe uh, maltase and maltose will be an example where we need to be very careful about what spellings that we can accept so moving on okay so we're gonna have a go at using the mark schemes to allocate a mark to each response given we type your mark allocation in the chat panel in the same order each response is given okay so we're going to do some examples okay so let's look at the first example in the delegate booklet if i can find it on here here we go So the question says, describe, it says, use a mark to allocate a mark to each, please type your mark allocation to chat panel in that in a minute. Describe what further information is required to help form the conclusion that cigarette smoking is the only cause of COPD. And the mark scheme says, information required about other factors such as diet, exercise, alcohol consumption, gender, exposure to pollution, genetic history, smokers or non-smokers will allow one mark for reference to lifestyle only so let's look at the first example okay and the first example gets one mark only so it says on here if we look at the example it says a factor of people's lifestyle. So lifestyle factors without any extra would give us one mark only. Okay, let's move on to the next example. Response B. The amount of pollution in the air that the person lives is any history of genetically caused lung disease in the person's family. So the second response, okay, would get two marks if we look. Because it makes reference to atmospheric pollution and a possible genetics cause. So that gets two marks. Okay, so that's good. 
Right, let's have a look at a genetics question. Okay, so the genetics question is given in the delegate book that I'm going to share the delegate book so we can have a look at this together. Oops, it is. Question two. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen for a moment. And I'm going to share with you the delegate book so we can all look at the question together. Okay. So here we go. Takes a little while to load up your screen. Hopefully, come in a minute. Just says loading. Yeah, okay, that should be there now. So we're going to go through. We're going to find Mark Ski. Going. One. Okay, here we go. Right. So there we are on the right hand side. It says haemophilia is a sex linked blood disorder that reduces the ability of blood to clot. Okay. These are the genotypes of four offspring, P, Q, R, and S. Draw a genetic diagram to show how these offspring are produced from one set of parents. Okay. And there we are. So you get one mark for the punch genotype and one mark for gametes and linkage. Okay. Let's look at the examples um, and, and consider what marks they might get. Okay. So response C is the first one. Down here, it's on this side. Okay, there's response C. Okay, it's got a little box on it, this one here. So you've got the mother and the father. Okay. And you've got it in parentheses, so in pointy brackets, combining gametes and linkage followed by a semicolon, meaning that both of these points is needed for one mark. Okay. So this one scores one mark because it correctly gives the parent genotypes, okay? It doesn't get the second mark because it doesn't show the gametes and then appropriate linkage, okay? Let's look at the next one, which is response D. Okay, now if I go down a little bit to response D. Okay, there we are. First response D. So this shows a Punnett square, which is fine. Okay. Um, and it shows the correct outcome and the correct genotypes of the offspring. Now, if we go back to the mark scheme, Mark seems says parent genotypes heterozygous and big HY. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and so we'll stop sharing this and return to the PowerPoint for a moment. And we'll go through what they gave as.
to the right slide. Okay. Okay, so the first one was Bond C, we decided it got one mark. Now, the second one here, um, they've only also given one mark to, which I think, I must say, is a little harsh. Um, I might have given this both marks, because even though they haven't written down the parent genotypes, they have in terms of the Punnett square. OK. So I think that the mother must be heterozygous and the father must be H XB, HY. But there we are. I mean, they, they said it wasn't clearly shown because they don't think it's given the parent genotypes. But I'm being, I think that's harsh. I think the, the Catholic mother must be that to be able to... Um, to be able to give that answer. OK, let's move on to the next one then. So the next one says, um, this question is about... If I go to this. This question is about identifying um, what a pathogen is. And the question is, state the meaning of a term pathogen. And there's lots of responses. Um, so response E, an organism that causes disease in the organism itself. It says organism rather than microorganism, so it doesn't meet the definition of a pathogen there. Okay, so that doesn't get a mark. We look at the next one. A microorganism that causes disease. Well, that's okay. That is a um, microorganism that causes disease is what the mark scheme says, so that gets one mark. Okay, let's. so we've done a little bit of looking at marking. Let's now look um, in a little bit more detail at the support available. I know we touched on this last time. Okay, so let's have a look. Right, so here, as we said last time, shows the support available for delivery of this qualification. Okay, getting started guide, you can download it. Training events like this one. Subject advisor, whose details I'm going to share with you in a moment. Um, community forums, there's the opportunity of joining those. Schemes of work, we spoke about last time. Skills mapping is produced at the end of every exam. Sample assessment materials are there. Examiner reports are there. And example mark responses are there as well. Past papers exam wizard mark schemes results plus we'll talk about access to scripts is available in terms of results which should help you ensure that when you put in for a review of marking that those reviews are more likely to result in a change because you've been focused you thought oh well maybe I'd give a mark for that rather than just sending in um, candidate. Uh, requests for, for remarks kind of willy-nilly without looking at whether there is a chance of the mark changing. Okay. Good. Let's move on to the next one. Right. So we shared this with you last time. It's a really good place for us to start because it shows you what that page looks like on the Pearson website. OK, so it shows you the name of the qualification. It shows you. Um, the course materials, uh, uh, it gives you a copy of the spec. It shows you Tim Lawrence, who is the um, Pearson contact supporting the teachers. It shows you published sources. It shows you. Teachers. And then if you click on course materials, this is what on that window opens up. And you can you can then filter using the drop down menu in terms of spec, in terms of sample assessment material, exam materials, which are all past papers, mark schemes uh, and question papers. And it allows you to do that. So it's a really good way of uh, accessing and showing you signposting where the materials are available. 
So specifications, exam materials, administrative documents, teaching and learning, and we continue to add to these materials. So teaching and learning materials are changed over time as more things are added to them, okay? If we move on then to the next slide, results plus we spoke about last time is really useful. It allows you not only to look at uh, your, your candidate performance in exams, it also can look at mock performance and it can look at performance within your center across different types of question and across different types of content. In other words, different parts of the spec. And it's really useful and really helpful in terms of refining your teaching, uh, um, as well as uh, looking at which resources are effective and where you need maybe to develop resources uh, and look at areas within your center perhaps where you're doing really well, sharing those with other colleagues and look at areas where maybe the students are not doing so well and maybe think about spending more time on that with that cohort or moving forward, developing uh, uh, materials that result in a slightly more efficient teaching method or uh, resulting in um, a higher attainment because you've modified your teaching to reflect the gaps. Okay, so that's really useful. If we look uh, next, it tells you about Results Plus in a bit more detail. So it's a free online service where it goes sense provide teachers and students with deep insight to exam performance. Developed in 2007, um, when Pearson looked at how it can modernize its exams, and it tells you how it's used. So students take their exam. These papers are sent central processing. They're scanned, electric, electric copies are made. And we can then uh, use this process because of the information it gives on an item level basis for each individual candidate, we can then look at those uh, performance data. Uh, it also allows us to look at examiner performance to see where examiners are marking um, more effectively, where examiners have high uh, reliability and high validity, so we can ensure that our papers are marked reliably and accurately. So the systems that Pearson use ensure the papers are marked reliably and accurately and provide lots of rich data for centres, but also for Pearson as an awarding organisation as well. Exam Wizard we spoke about last time. It's really useful. It's free to any centres that have um, edXL online uh, access. It allows you to make homework assignments, topic tests, and mock exams. And it, you have a login. It also stores the ones that you develop on there. So if you develop a, a, a series of questions on human reproduction and fertility, you can use those questions again next year with your uh, next cohort. And you can confer, compare performance with previous cohorts. And you can use that to... Um, further focus your, your teaching on those areas where students need more help. So questions can be tagged against unit, topic, assessment, objective, or you can choose a whole past paper. It, it also, for each item and question that you select within Exam Wizard, it produces a, a, a mark scheme, which you can apply. You can use the examiner report to see how those mark schemes were applied and look at additional guidance. Um, it has the most recent exam content on it already. Uh, so it comes on quite quickly in terms of the cycle. And you can use it to understand, as I said, where students need more support, uh, more information and adapt your teaching strategy. So it's a really useful um, strategy. We spoke about access to scripts and how useful this is. Access to scripts in particular allows you to focus on which scripts you want to have remarked. It's free, it's instant from results day, allows you to see all your students mark papers free of charge. It's also available for all qualifications and access to Excel online. The scripts don't have examiner annotations on them. Uh, you can use the access to scripts alongside results plus. Um, gives you a detailed breakdown of your students' performance in exams. You use both these services to help you identify topics and skills where students can benefit from future learning, which we said. Okay. Um, 
and it, it tells you there's a, a user guide you can look at which is available from Pearson okay let's move on uh, as we said before there are as I said last week rather there are as well as these resources you can purchase textbooks from Pearson's that are designed to support the qualification as I said last week it's then not essential often centers find them helpful, but you can you don't need to use the Pearson textbook to deliver the qualification. Okay, it's not essential, but often people find it helpful. Okay, and this shows you the, there we are, that's the latest book, Bradfield and Potter, it's been around for a while. Um, they are specifically written for the course. Um, each student book provides access to active books, um, supported through teaching hubs and people find them useful but as i said they're not essential for delivering the course finally as i said which is really important uh, your subject advisor is tim lawrence that gives his quality his, his contact details uh through contact us through the qualification page also his phone number also his email address and he is the first point of contact for any centres delivering this qualification. Okay, so he's your first point of contact. Um, he will endeavour to respond to your questions. If he is unable to answer the question, he will uh, act as a conduit and he will deliver your question to one of the experts from the senior examining team within human biology who will answer your question for you. OK, often uh, delegates and schools are concerned about mark schemes, OK, that they don't agree with a mark scheme um, or that they uh, they don't understand how the mark scheme has been applied or the reasons for that. This is a sort of thing that you can ask via your subject advisor. OK, they can't give you, obviously, information about individual candidates and candidate questions, but they can help you as a teacher understand the mark schemes and how they're applied okay often when i was an examiner and while i was a teacher i didn't necessarily agree with a mark scheme i'd say well i wouldn't give a mark for that or i'd give an additional mark for this you don't as teachers have to agree with the mark schemes to be a good teacher what you need to be able to do is to understand the mark scheme understand how they're applied and help with that understanding to ensure that your students in future um, are able to answer the question uh, to the best of our ability and with an answer that's likely to produce the highest mark based on their knowledge. OK, so I've often had mark schemes I don't agree with, but as long as I understand them, I can see how they're applied. So it's about understanding the mark scheme and how it's applied. That's the important thing. Right. Thank you very much for uh, engaging today with me. Um, I'm putting the chat box up. Um, what I'd like to do now is we've got about five minutes. It's about 10 to, what have I got here? About 10.48. If you have any questions, please type these in the chat box and, and I will endeavour to answer them. If you don't have any questions, can I thank you for your engagement and your attention and your time with me this morning? But I'll stay around for five or minutes or so to answer any questions that you may have. Let me just um, type this on here. My typing skills are a bit. Please ask me a question and I'll respond to it. Thank you. 
apparently I've got to move on and put the Pearson logo on at the end. There we are, I've got to put the Pearson logo on. There we are. Um, any questions for me? If not, have a lovely day. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Hope it's been useful for you. Um, I know it's, if you're, if you're just starting, there's lots of information that you need. Try and look at the qualification website. There's lots of materials on there. If you have any questions, if you're just starting, please get in touch with Tim Lawrence, who's our um, science advisor for human biology. He will be very helpful. If not, you can also get in touch with your Pearson local representative in the area of the world that you're in, and they'll give you more support as well. Any more questions, please type them into the box for me. Thank you very much.